Welcome to the Jews of Lithuania and beyond. Uh, we have viewers from all over the world, many whose ancestors came from Lithuania or nearby countries. I think the entire Jewish population of South Africa is on Zoom today, thanks to my cousin Sybil. For the next four Sundays, we will explore Lithuania, a beautiful country with a rich Jewish culture that sadly was almost completely exterminated, but fortunately today is experiencing a rebirth of memory and a restoration of Jewish sites. Please hold all questions and comments until the end of the presentation, which will last about 45 minutes. When we're all done, I'll do my best to answer your questions. And if I don't know the answers, I'll find them out before our next presentation. If you watch my presentation on Morocco, I started out by asking why Morocco? So now I'm asking why Lithuania? And that's an easy answer. All four of my grandparents were lit box. I admit it's not at the top of every tourist list. And even though I knew it was the land of my heritage, I never thought I'd go there, not just once, but twice. When I mentioned that I was going to Lithuania, I got these actual comments. You're going to Lithuania? Why? That was from many different people. Where is it? Scandinavia? Close, but no cigar. And that was from my hairdresser. Never heard of it. That was from my dentist, but I have to share that she is yeah. from Vietnam. <laughs> Time out for vocabulary word. Pale of settlement. The pale was in the Russian Empire and it was an area where Jews were confined. If you look at the map, you'll see that the area covered other countries besides Lithuania. And I'll be giving more details about it in a later slide. Are you a Litvak? You might be surprised. The term Litvak itself originates from Litwak with a W, a Polish term meaning a man from Lithuania. This definition, however, went out of use before the 19th century, only to be revived around 1880 in the narrow meaning of a Lithuanian Jew. Jews born in Lithuania are not really called Lithuanians. They are Litvaks. But even if your family didn't come from Lithuania, you may still be a Litvak. Why? Because the term Litvak doesn't just refer to Jews from Lithuania, it also includes those from Belarus, Latvia, Northeastern Sawaki, Bialystok, regions of Poland, as well as some border areas of Russia and the Ukraine. The reason the term is so broadly used is that Litvak applies to most Jews in the Pale of Settlement who were not Hasidim. By the way, my grandmother spoke derogatorily about the Hasidim, and I found out that there was an historical basis for this, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. It turns out that there are differences between Litvaks and other Ashkenazi Jews. Litvaks have a distinctive Yiddish dialect. They eat kugel on Shabbos, while other Eastern European Jews eat kegel. When Litvaks pray, they stand still and only move their lips. In other words, they don't daven. Litvaks are characterized as being more rational, dogmatic, critical, authoritarian, and less emotional than other branches of Ashkenazi Jewry. However, judging from my own family, I'm not sure about less emotional. My first trip to Lithuania was in 2012 when my daughter Debbie and I went with an organized Jewish group in search of our Litvak heritage. It was amazing, eye-opening, and very enlightening. What I didn't know then was that I had two second cousins, Ella and Asia, 
alive and living in Kovno. By the way, I will be using the Yiddish place names, so you will hear Kovno for Kaunas and Vilna for Vilnius. In 2016, through the magic of internet, I found another cousin, Sybil Castle, living in Cape Town, South Africa. Somehow she learned that three other cousins whom I did not know were all going to be at the Jewish Genealogy Conference in Seattle. She put us in touch and the rest is history. They say you can't choose your relatives, but you can choose your friends. We were very lucky. Not only were we related, but we bonded immediately and became lifelong friends. We decided to plan a family reunion. We were all related to my great-great-grandfather, Avram Benish Antelept. In the summer of 2017, almost 90 of his descendants from Lithuania, South Africa, Brazil, Canada, as well as from all over the US, met for a reunion in New York City. But that's a story for another time when I do a presentation on Jewish genealogy, if you like. In September 2018, four cousins and our husbands went to Lithuania to visit our mishpacha. The blogs from my two trips will be the basis for our journey to the land of the Litvaks. But first, a little history. As my cousin Ella said at our reunion, without the past, there is no future. And I would add, without the past, there is no understanding of the present. So much of the history of Lithuania is housed in the Lithuanian Historical State Archives. Located in an old, dreary Soviet-style building, we walked multiple flights of stairs and entered a large room. In front of us were the most famous documents in the Lithuanian archives. No one wore gloves to handle these very old, fragile pieces of paper, and we were allowed to take pictures in a very brightly lit room. It was as we were in our own national archives with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and the Bill of Rights out in the open and inches away from us. One document was a land grant Catherine the Great gave to one of her many lovers. I really think it was the one who killed her husband. The oldest document was almost 800 years old, dating from the 1300s. Instead of signatures, they were signed with seals. Lithuania's name was first written in 1009 in an abbey in Germany. It refers to a pagan Baltic tribe living in the interior of what today is Lithuania. Lithuania was founded by Mindo Yugas when he united the separate states in the 13th century. Take a good look at this room. It was a side room and it contained only Jewish documents with thousands and thousands of volumes. Debbie and I were horrified when an obnoxious family on our trip started taking books down from the shelves and pouring through them. Our guide quickly pointed out that such behavior was not allowed. We were embarrassed that our hosts had to deal with ugly Americans. Why did the Jews go to Lithuania and where did they come from? There are a couple of possibilities. Some may have migrated from southern Russia. Additionally, when the Crusades brought anti-Semitism to Western Europe in the 12th century, to escape persecution, Jews kept moving further and further east. After the Teutonic Knights massacred the inhabitants, both Jews and non-Jews in Poland and Lithuania, the areas needed to repopulate. In 1323, Grand Duke Gediminas of Lithuania issued an invitation to merchants and craftspeople promising tax exemptions, freedom of worship, and religious tolerance. The first document confirming the presence of Jews in Lithuania 
The first document confirming the presence of Jews in Lithuania is the Charter of 1388, in which the Grand Duke Vaitotis granted privileges to the Jews of a town called Trakai, the second capital of Lithuania. It is a remarkable document of tolerance in an age of Western persecution. Under the charter, the Lithuanian Jews form a class freemen on an equal basis with other citizens. The tolerance and generosity of Polish kings and Lithuanian grand dukes is renowned in Jewish history. It was based both on the ruler's wisdom to use Jewish skills, languages, and contacts to contracts to grow the economy, and on concepts of tolerance that were astounding for their time. Gediminas, who founded Lithuania as a political entity, was a follower of paganism. As late as the 14th century, Lithuania was the last of the European countries to convert to Catholicism, which may have accounted for its greater degree of goodwill toward the Jews. Vitotas preferred Jews over other minorities and endorsed Jewish communities, giving them political, religious, and civil rights. Casimir IV summed it up, quoting, we take the Jews under our protection in our own interest of the state so that they may feel safe. The favorable attitude toward the Jews changed under Casimir's son, J.G. Elion, exp who expelled them in 1495. What was the reason? In one word, money. The king was trying to avoid payments to Jewish creditors and confiscated their property. However, Lithuanians' economy could not survive without the Jews. As financiers, traders, and merchants, they form the backbone of the country's commercial life. So, after eight years, he allowed them back, restoring their property and rights, which resulted in some lawsuits by people who had already claimed their property. The nobility in the middle of the 16th century became more and more antagonistic toward the Jews. Again, at first, it was due to economic reasons. The Lords preferred Jewish middlemen in dealing with the agricultural classes and Jews were leaseholders of custom revenues. Anyway, the Jews were very active in helping the Lords with their businesses, but they lived under, juris under the jurisdiction of the King and they lived on his lands the, and the nobility had no control over them. In addition, Mixed marriages between Catholic women and Jewish men increased and their children were sometimes educated as Jews. So consequently, the clergy, as well as the nobility, fostered the anti-Jewish sentiments. The opposition to the Jews was formalized in the Lithuanian statute of 1566 under the Grand Duke Sigismund II. And this is what it said. The Jew shall not wear costly clothing, nor gold chains, nor shall their wives wear gold or silver ornaments. The Jews shall not have silver ornaments on their sabers and daggers. They shall be distinguished by characteristic clothes. They shall wear yellow caps and their wives shall wear yellow kerchiefs of yellow linen in order that all may be enabled to distinguish between Christians and Jews. Despite these restrictions, the king prevented the nobility from modifying the old charters granting certain rights to the Jews. In the 16th century, Lithuania faced um, military problems with its neighbor Muscovy and Poland experienced danger from Turkey and the Crimea. So both countries felt it would be advantageous to form a permanent union. In 1569, Poland and Lithuania were united to become the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, one of the largest empires in history. In general, it was a time of prosperity and safety for the Jews in both countries. During this period, Vilna became a major political center for Jews. 
In addition to the four Christian estates in medieval times, nobles, clergy, townspeople, and peasants, Jews were considered a separate estate. The self-governing body of the Jews was called the Kahal. In 1580, four Kahals joined together to become the Council of Four Lands, which gave the Jews a large member of self-rule not enjoyed for centuries. They had their own schools, courts, social services, collected taxes, and appointed rabbis, cantors, and ritual slaughterers. But the good times, as usual, were not to last. Beginning in the 16th and continuing through the 18th centuries, a series of military conflicts occurred between the Cossacks, East Slavic Orthodox Christians, and the states that they lived in, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Russian Empire. The fury of these uprisings brought devastation to the entire country of Lithuania and ravaged the Jewish communities there. The Cossack uprisings destroyed the organization of the Lithuanian Jewish communities. The survivors who returned to their old, old homes in the latter half of the 17th century were practically destitute, unable to earn a living. The Grand Duke John Casimir sought to ameliorate their condition by granting various concessions to the Lithuanian Jewish communities. The ever efforts to resurrect the old power of the Cajals were not successful. The impoverished Jewish mer merchants had to borrow money from the nobility, churches, monasteries, and various other religious orders. These loans were usually for an unlimited period and were secured by mortgages on the real estate of the Cajals. Consequently, the Cajals became hopelessly indebted to the clergy and the nobility. In 1764, when the council failed to deliver the uh, required taxes, a census of Jews was taken, so there would be a list of individual Jews to tax. 20 years later, ahead of a tax increase, another census was taken. This is very, very important for us. These two censuses are the earliest genealogical records of Lithuanian Jews. It's possible your relatives could be on them. Time out for a vocabulary word. Geon is the title of Jewish spiritual leaders and um, scholars who headed Talmudic academies. For Jews, the most important event in the 18th century was the rise of Elijah ben Solomon Zalman, known as the Vilna Gaon, one of the most influential rabbinic authorities since Rashi in the Middle Ages, and some say the greatest Jewish scholar of all time. Besides his Jewish knowledge and writings, he studied mathematics, astronomy, science, music, philosophy, and linguistics. The Gaon's interest in all of these subjects was based on his hope to gain better knowledge of the Torah. His righteousness and kindness were also legendary. The Gaon was the leading opponent of the Hasidim, Hasidic movement founded by Rabbi Baal Shem Tov in the 1730s in Poland. When Hasidic Judaism became influential in Lithuania, the Vilna Gaon took steps to check its popularity. The emphasis of Hasidim on mysticism and fervent worship particularly bothered him. He and others felt that this type of worship detracted from the importance of Torah study. If you remember, I said my grandmother was disdainful of the Hasidim. Now you know the historical basis for why she and other Litvox looked down on them, or as she said, feh. On another personal note, the Gaon was so revered that many Litvox wanted to find a genealogical connection to him. My mother, who was a snob, always said that our family was related. But a book exists that shows all of his descendants, and unfortunately, our family name does not appear on it. 
The Gaia died, the Gaon died in Vilna and is buried in the only Jewish cemetery that still exists. The Gaon's powerful intellect and learning caused Vilna to become known all over the world as the spiritual center of Jews. Today, Jews from all over visit his mausoleum. And just like at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, these pilgrims leave notes and prayers, hoping that these prayers will be answered. Time out for vocabulary word. Gematria is an alphanumeric code assigning numeric value to a word based on its letters. In the next slide, you'll find out why you need to know this. April 23rd, 2020 marked the 300th anniversary of the birth of the Vilna Gaon. In comm commemoration, and I find this amazing, the Bank of Lithuania minted its first coin containing Hebrew letters. The head side of the coin features the Hebrew letter Shin, whose value according to the Gematria alphanumeric code is 300 for the 300th anniversary. And it's followed by the acronym in Hebrew of Gaon Rabbi Elijah. The tale's rim reads in Hebrew, the year of the Vilna Gaon and the history of the Jews of Lithuania. Sadly, additional plans to celebrate this momentous milestone in Lithuania and Israel were thwarted by the coronavirus. Now in our next slide, we'll find out more about the Pale of Settlement. On a simple level, due to warfare, Poland was partitioned three times between 1772 and 1775, eventually ceasing to exist as a state and Lithuania became part of Russia. If you've ever done any Jewish genealogy, you may have found out as I have that in one document, your ancestor came from Poland, in another Russia, and in a third Lithuania, when actually they were all the same place. Only the borders and ruling countries changed. Previously, there were very, very few Jews in Russia, but with the new annexation, the Russians ended up having the largest population of Jews in the world. However, they didn't want them, and they didn't know what to do with them, resulting in a number of decrees restricting Jewish rights. Catherine the not so great created the Pale of Settlement, combining Jews to a restricted area and prohibiting them from living on agriculture land and owning land. Later though, Alex Alexander II granted more rights of residence be beyond the Pale to merchants able to pay the registration fees, to university graduates, to those engaged in medical professions and to various craftsmen. I guess they found out they needed the Jews. Tsar Nicholas I wanted to destroy all Jewish life and his cultural life, not physical life. And his reign constitutes a painful part of European Jewish history. Subsequent Tsars wanted to turn the Jews into good Russians. Alexander I created the statute concerning the organization of Jews. The statute required that every Jew had to have an inherited surname. This is very, very important for Jewish genealogy because prior to that time, most Ashkenazi Jews did not have inherited last names, which makes research very difficult. If you're wondering why Jews suddenly to have last names, they, why they needed them, once again, the answer is economics. The czars wanted to count the Jews and keep track of them for purposes of taxation. The Tsars also tried to get Jews to attend Russian schools to convert them and make them more Russian. When this didn't work, they turned to conscription. Before 1825, Jews were not allowed in the Russian military. But when the schools failed to re-educate and convert Jews, Nicholas used conscription to make them good Russians. 
The decree of 1827 made Jews liable for military service. Each year, the Jewish community had to supply four recruits per every thousand of the population, allowing conscription between the ages of 12 and 25. In practice, Jewish children were often conscripted as young as eight or nine. At the age of 12, they would be placed for their six year military education in Cantonist schools, originally created by Peter the Great, requiring that every regiment have a school for 50 boys. When their education was completed, again, I apologize, things are popping up on my screen. When their education was completed, they were forced to serve in the Imperial Russian army for 25 years, often never seeing their families again. To make them more Russian and less Jewish, officials took away their phylacteries, their prayer books, prayer shawls, forced them to eat pork and physically abused them. At least half of the Canton children converted to Christianity as a means to survive it. We all have family stories of how our grandfathers and great grandfathers tried to escape the hell that was the Russian army. I was told when the recruiters came to get my grandfather, his mother told them that he'd be ready to leave in the morning. Meanwhile, meanwhile he ran away in the night. I have no way of knowing if this is true or not. I was surprised to find out that one reputable researcher makes a credible case that the Jews never used the various methods listed on the slide. But most historians disagree with him because there is so much anecdotal evidence. You probably have your own family story. At the end of the 19th century, over 5 million Jews lived in the Pale of Settlement. I always wondered why my grandparents left Lithuania and I regret I never asked. My maternal grandmother left at 19, never to see her parents again. My grandsons are now 20 and 22. I imagine how horrible it would be if we were living in the 19th century with no phones, let alone cell phones, no computers, no Zoom, no airplanes, and Noah and Leo left for a faraway country for good. So why did our ancestors leave the old country? In Russia, as you learned, oppression and harsh decrees were the official method of, quote, solving the Jewish problem that I had talked about. And there was conscription, but there were other reasons. With more and more economic restrictions, Jews had fewer choices of ways to make a living because the competition was fierce. And then there were the pogroms. Pogrom is a Russian word meaning to wreak havoc, to demolish violently. The term can be broadly used for various anti-Semitic acts throughout history, but it is mainly used to describe the attacks on Jews in the Russian empire, mostly within the Pale of Settlement. When the Russian government blamed the assassination of Alexander II in 1881 on the Jews, anti-Jewish events turned into a wave of over 200 pogroms. The Jews had their property looted and were raped and murdered. The pogroms were organized locally, but historians disagree as to whether the Russian government was involved in coordinating the attacks. In any event, the official response was often slow. Only after days of violence did the police and military intervene to restore order, sometimes even joining in the violent mobs. Would you have left? Over 2.5 million Jews left Eastern Europe during the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. I am thankful every day that all four of my grandparents immigrated to America. Many Litvaks, including members of my own family, went to other countries. My maternal grandmother's relatives went to Canada, Brazil, Israel, England, and South Africa. Interestingly, 
The majority of Jews in South Africa today are from Lithuania. So why did some stay? My grandmother's brother and one sister came to America, but her parents and two of her older sisters remain behind. I'm guessing that her sisters stayed because they were married with families and their parents chose to stay, but it's only a guess. My great grandparents died in the 1920s of natural causes. Other members of my family were murdered in the Holocaust. For those Jews who stayed, something worse than pogroms was on the horizon. World War I. From our earliest consciousness as Jews, we learn about the Holocaust. We read books, watch movies, visited camps and museums, including Yad Vashem, and heard the firsthand stories of survivors. We were taught never to forget the Shoah. But what did we know, what do you know about the Jews living in the Russian empire during World War I? I must confess I knew very little until I began my research. But what I found out was that it was not a good time to be a Jew. In fact, it was terrible. The next few slides present a very simplified discussion of a very complex time. World War I had a profound impact on those Jews remaining in the Russian Empire. The frequent movie, movement of armies back and forth across the Pale of Settlement over a four year period disrupted the lives of all the region's inhabitants, but especially the four million Jews in the war torn area who were left impoverished and starving. Dan's grandfather was already in America when the war started. Leaving behind to survive on their own, Dan's grandmother, Necha, his father, Leo, and his aunt, Sophie. Necha told stories about having to adapt to living under the Russians one day and the Germans the next. In addition to poverty and starvation, the most hardship was the expulsion of the Jews of Lithuania. In May 1915, 200,000 Jews were banished from Kovno province, leaving them homeless without their property, which was destroyed or looted. If they couldn't find wagons, they walked until hungry and exhausted, they reached a train station where they were loaded into crowded freight cars that carried them into the interior of Russia. Jews from one shtetl were locked into freight cars for 10 days. By the time the cars were open, everyone had lost consciousness. 16 of the passengers had scarlet fever and one had typhoid. Does this sound familiar? Just remember, this took place almost 30 years before the Holocaust. By 1915, as German forces advanced into Russian territory, more than a half million Jews were expelled from frontline areas, including all of Northern Lithuania and much of Latvia. The expulsion resulted in the de facto abolition of the Pale of Settlement. Many other Jews not subject to expulsion fled from the fighting on their own, moving from the countryside to cities. By 1915, more than 80,000 Russian Jews, war refugees had congregated in Warsaw and 22,000 additional Jews settled in Vilna. Back to conscription. At the outbreak of World War I, the um, Russian army called for general conscription. By the end of the war, 600,000 Jews had served in the Russian armies. The Jews were blamed for everything. The falsehoods included the, included the following. Russian military preparations were ruined by Jewish traders. Jewish contractors supplied the Russian army with spoiled meat and expired canned goods that poisoned thousands of Russian soldiers. Jewish soldiers des deserted their posts and sold Russian secrets to the Germans. Jewish doctors could not be trusted to heal wounded Russian soldiers because they might simply kill the soldiers instead. On all fronts, the ignorant Russian soldiers were continually told of these falsehoods of horrible betrayals carried out by the Jews. 
I was surprised to find out that my grandmother's first husband was actually an officer in the Tsar's army. He survived World War I only to die from the Spanish flu. In the spring and summer of 1950, uh, Germany moved into Poland, Lithuania, and Western Belarus. The war had brought vast, eruption, vast disruption to the city of Vilna. After over a century of Russian rule, the city was now controlled by a German military regime that went, on one hand exploited the local population and on the other granted it freedoms of expression, association and education that had been unheard of under the czars, even guaranteeing equal rights to Jews and non-Jews. As hard as it may be to believe, Jews were treated better by the Germans than the Russians in this point in time. Jews were able to continue with educational, cultural, and charitable activities with Hebrew and Yiddish schools, libraries, discussion societies, and Yiddish plays. They were also permit, permitted to participate in diverse political organizations such as the Zionists and Socialists. And then the war was finally over. After World War I, Lithuania, like many other occupied countries, wanted their independence. Jews took an active part in the freedom wars of Lithuania. On December 29, 1918, when the government called for volunteers to defend the state, 500 Jews applied. More than 3,000 Jews ended up serving in the Lithuanian army. In 1922, the League of Nations awarded Vilna to Poland, which was a fact I had never heard of and Kovno became the capital of Lithuania until the eve of World War II. For about eight years, Jews were recognized by and included in the Lithuanian government, which initially gave the Jews a wide amount of autonomy in education and taxation through community councils. Just look at the list granted in an eight point pledge of Jewish rights in Lithuania representation in parliament, recognition of Yiddish and Hebrew, freedom to worship as Jews, state support of Jewish schools. Sounds good for the Jews, right? Unfortunately, when Lithuania wrote its constitution, these rights were not included and life once again began to become worse for the Jews. The anti-Semitic tendencies in Lithuania got worse by the end of the 1920s and during the 1930s. Under the nationalists, the anti-Semitic policy was directed especially, especially against Jewish economic positions. I imagine you're not surprised, I sure wasn't. The more I learn about anti-Semitism, the more I realize that a major factor is money. The Jews who formed about one third of the total population of the larger towns held many economic positions, many in small trade and crafts. The rapid process of urbanization after the war caused growing economic competition. The anti-Semitic campaign in the 1930s was led mainly by the organization of Lithuanian traders and workers. Its slogan was, Lithuania for the Lithuanians, and Jews were not, nor are they now, considered Lithuanians. The government encouraged this competition. Lithuanian traders, for example, enjoyed reductions in taxation, while the Jews were systematically dispossessed of their economic positions. As a result, many Jews were deprived of their livelihoods and had to emigrate. Between 1928 and 39, almost 14,000 Jews emigrated from Lithuania. We have now come to the eve of World War II, followed by 50 years of Soviet occupation. We have come to the end of our historic presentation for now. But before we examine the, these two events, it's important to view the rich cultural history of Lithuanian Jewry, 
so that we can understand and appreciate the great loss that was about to occur. Next Sunday at 10 a.m., not noon, join with me as we visit the three largest cities in Lithuania. I'm sure most of you have heard of Kovno and Vilna, but we will also go to Klaipeda, a city previously unknown to me, but a city with a long Jewish heritage. I will share once in a lifetime experiences. We will spend a most unusual Rosh Hashanah in Kovno, celebrate Shabbat at a thriving Jewish preschool in Vilna, help write the first Lithuanian Torah in over 80 years, view remarkable recent archeological discoveries at the great synagogue in Vilna and so much more. It's a Zoom journey you won't wanna miss. Thank you all so much for participating. Thank you again for watching. And um, you, if you have a question, you're welcome or a comment because I'm sure a lot of you have Lithuanian history or, or history at least from the Pale of Settlement. So um, if you, um, I can't see everybody. So I guess you'll just have to jump in. Um, if you go into the upper right corner, your, your mom can show you. Um, if you hit view, you can change it to gallery. Okay. And then you should be, um, there's you know a lot of people, so you'd have to scroll through to see everybody, but that will show you more than like a couple people at a time. Okay. I'm looking at the first page. Roberta, did you want to say something or just wave hello? I can't hear you. You're muted. You're still muted. Okay. What was, just a trivial detail about ancient history in Lithuania. Originally, the first synagogue was actually there when it was pagan. And the pagans uh, had no problem with Jews there and also allowed the Jews to build their synagogue in high places. But when they became Catholic, so then having synagogues at the high places was uh, not good. So You're they right. had, they had to change to lower lower places because they didn't want to be uh, above the, uh, the the churches. And I'm going to talk about that in my very next slide. I'm going to explain what they did to circum circumvent that. Thank you, Stan. Any other questions or comments on the first page? I would just like to, if I may say, hello, Hilda from South Africa. I really mm -hmm. want to thank you. I thought you've given a brilliant lecture, mm -hmm. point for point absolutely interesting and beautifully presented thank you very very much thank you sybil um I hilda. To... oh hilda thank you hilda. hilda i'm so sorry you sound to my ears all i hate to say that but all uh, that african. african sound alike so i thought you were that's you were... right we do we do in fact. Yes. okay i'm gonna go to the second page and see if anybody raises their hand Oh, women, I just went on to the third page. Um, Rona. Rona? Yes, I have a question. I don't. Hi, everyone. It's Rana Schneider from. Oh, Rana. Uh, I'm Mali. so sorry, Rana. Huh? Mm -hmm. And um, I, my question is Has anyone ever tried to calculate if there wasn't a Holocaust? and all these terrible pogroms, how many Jews there would have been? Was our population cut in half or like 5 million uh, or 50 million, excuse me? I don't know the answer to that. We always talk about uh, the 6 million killed during the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Of course, many Jews were killed in World War I, in the Inquisition, and on and on and on throughout history. But I, mm -hmm. I think it's a fascinating question, but I don't have the answer. If somebody else does, either speak up now or let us know next time. Thank you, Shirley, and thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thanks, Rana. Good to see you. Thank Rana's you, finally. Rana. Ron is one of my Antelope cousins. Okay, I'm going on to the third page. If anybody on the third page would like to ask a question or make a comment, I don't see any hands. Uh, fourth page, fifth page. 
Okay. Um, I'll throw it open if I missed your hands or you would like to comment or say anything, go for it. I have a question coming from uh, your relative in Canada. Uh, when we can travel again, uh, are you planning another uh, trip and tour? To Lithuania? Yeah. Um, I'm, I haven't really thought about it. The first time I went was on a tour and the second time four cousins on the West Coast got together and went but I wouldn't rule it out. It's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful country, um, amazingly. And uh, if, you, if you come back next Sunday, you'll be seeing the very modern uh, cities that we go to, which for some reason, I just didn't expect them to be uh, as modern and cosmopolitan as they were. So let's think about it, okay? Really? <laughs> yes. Would you like to introduce Ellen and Asia? Uh, I'm going to next time. Oh, next time. They, okay. Next time okay. You, you will see, um, I think you'll see them next time. I have to say, I hope you hang in with me till the very last presentation because um, Ella and Asia lived under Soviet domination and I tell that part in Ella's words. So it's not dry history. It's actually a Jew who lived under those times. And in fact, she has a very wonderful story about Levi Jeans. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. If, if I can see them, I'd introduce them though this time. Well, they're, they're on uh, three or I four, I think. Okay, I'll see. Oh, they, they don't have the cameras. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. they don't have their camera. Okay. Ella and uh, Asia, could you just say something and then you're- Oh, there she is. She's on three on me for my- Okay. Uh, Ella, okay. Ella. Yes, I am here. There. Thank you. Thank Ella. you, Shirley, for your wonderful presentation. It, it's really a brilliant work of yours. And uh, as I mentioned, maybe not for everybody, but I mentioned on the uh, our Facebook uh, page of Antelope family. And uh, I'm sure, I was sure, and I'm now sure that those of you who have Litwerk roots are really, uh, really can take pride in being Litwerk. Yes. So the history of Lithuanian Jew, uh, Jews show it and uh, Lithuanian Jews, Litvaks, were always those who um, brought a lot of novelty, a lot of great things to Lithuanian Jewish tradition, education, culture, and everything that makes us proud of being Litvak. Yes, and I have to say my two Lithuanian cousins are brilliant. They really are. Their, their knowledge and command of English amazes me. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ella. By the way, what time is it in Lithuania? Uh, it's uh, 11 p.m. Okay, it's 11 p.m. in, in Lithuania. 10, 10, 10 and hours. in South Africa. Yeah. Okay, yeah. any other comments, questions? Yes, okay. I'm raising my hand. So I can't see everybody because there are five screens. So just I, I actually raised my electronic hand. Oh, I, oh, okay. I am, I am in, on top on the left, if you can see me. Um, I am on the first, I should be on the first page. If you raise your electronic. Yes, hand. yes, yes. I see you. Okay. So hi. It's hi. Thank you for your lecture. It's very very interesting and actually i was surprised to hear my name which is asia and i was also born in vilna really and i lived there uh, until 71 when i immigrated to israel and i i actually now live in san jose from 1995. well we'll have to meet yeah, so it's a very interesting coincidence. I heard my yeah. name, but how we did don't you, know each other. How did you find out about the presentation? Um, Elise Wessels, my friend, sent me uh, an email. 
where where this presentation was mentioned yes terrific as i said we'll have to meet soon yes thank you, thank you. anybody else yeah i had a question if I'm go ahead uh yeah i wanted to ask uh this has been wonderful and thank you so very much but i see that it's being recorded is there any way that we'll be able to hear and see the recording again yes uh, if you're a glutton for punishment, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. um, my wonderful tech man, Oliver, um, it, it is being recorded and right. he will, um, he will edit it and put it up on a YouTube link and hopefully he'll send out the link who, to everybody who participated today. That's great because there was uh, such great information wonderful. and I take notes and I'd like to really- Yeah, it, well. it's so much wonderful. information and I left out so much um, the, because uh, I have to. I, yeah, I tr no, you did a great job. Oh, look at that chat. Yep, I, I, if everybody goes and checks out the chat, um, I just put the Temple Manuel Okay, a yeah. YouTube link. That's where everything will be posted. Um, so we'll hopefully get up um, this episode before next Sunday. Thank you. That's great. Excellent. And thank you for the presentation. It was just absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. I'd like to ask something. Okay. Uh, if we, my sister who just spoke, uh, and I know our grandfather came from Vilna, but we don't know anything about his family, his parents' names, anything. Is there any way we can find out things without knowing names? Um, if you have a name, yeah. uh, it's possible. Um, I do a lot of Jewish genealogy. And if my temple was interested, I was going to offer a course on on how to trace your Jewish roots. So if you're interested, um, let let my temple manual know. Um, and it, you could go to temple manual San, San Jose. Oliver, how would they let temple know if they're interested in a yeah. course? On um, let me let me go ahead and, and um, I'll what I'm going to do is I will paste a contact us page. I, I, I apologize for my eight month and old in the background. Um, I'm, I'm going to post a contact us page, which you can then um, just put a little submission note in there, and then that will go to the uh, administrative staff, and then we can make note of that and, and pass along to the powers that be. Vivian Cohen, so you know me. Yeah, yes. really I do. Yeah, your name came up different though, differently. Oh, really? Well, thank I, I knew you who so you much. were, but it was funny. I kept looking at the name. Um, uh, you did a great job. Oh, know. thank you. Thank you. There, yes, there are ways to trace your roots. Um, if you have a little bit of information, sometimes it leads to more. I mean, it was through researching Jewish genealogy that I found my cousins <laughs> in Lithuania, my cousins in South Africa, and cousins all over the world that I didn't even know I had. And it led to the, the reunion in New York. So it's, it's very exciting. And um, I would like to do a presentation if there is a demand for it. Yes, thank okay. you. Anything, else? Anything else? I'd like to just say something. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Meryl Kravitz. I live here in San Jose. Hello. And I did a Fulbright in Lithuania back in 2001. Okay. And so I'm really excited about this um, and I'm looking forward to hearing more. Thank you. Good, good. And, and I, I hope you'll add a, to it um, when we're all done because I'm sure you'll have a lot to add. Well, living there, you see a perspective, but doesn't mean it's the right one. I was only there for six months, so. That's longer than most <laughs> of us, probably all of us, except for, for my cousins in Lithuania. Who, who were born there and we yeah. have somebody from there. Or so. people who are from there. I'm, yeah. I'm excited about hearing this. Thank you. Thank you. Anything Anything more? I was just going to, am I on? Uh, somebody speaking. I, yeah. Oh. Hi. Hi, my name's Pam. And. Ella um, told me about this and but from the National Archive, I was there and they were so kind, Ella and Asa, and they're amazing. But they um, introduced me to the National Archives there and that's where there was so much information on my family. So um, 
thinking that if you contacted them, I've con <laughs> been in contact with them, they can research your father, grandfather's name. Yes. Okay. Um, the only problem is the name Cohen is pretty common. Um, so she possibly, it would be necessary to do some re research first using something like ancestry or Jewish Chan to see if you can find out um, some of the names of your ancestors. And it's possible to do this through uh, like um, the immigration to Ellis Island or other ports or through the census. So you might need more information if you have a very common name before you contact um, the archives, but uh, the archives is wonderful and you can certainly try. Bernie, can I ask you something? Yes. Uh, just off the bat, I don't expect you to have the answer. But my, my, my grandmother actually passed away in Cape Town before I was born, but her whole family name was Ritepsky. And I was wondering whether that name came from Ritova. And yet her, her brother kept on speaking about Vilnius, that, he'd been, that he was from Vilna. And my grandfather was also from Bial, that's on the grandfather's side. Bial or Bile, we used to say. I mean, I used to think maybe they're from Bialystok originally, but uh, they came from, from Vilna as well. And he always used to say, oh, my violin, my violin. I used to play the violin in different concerts and, and it got stolen, it got stolen at the, at the, at, at, at the train station. Oh. And he remember, so I don't know if it was in Vilna or if it was in, uh, in the Ritava or where, but I always used to hear that story about his violin that got stolen. But uh, anyway, a, yeah. Um, and, and from my father's point side, from Poland, the, during the First World War, his mother died, I believe, uh, of a Spanish flu, and his father was murdered, and their whole family were murdered, except he was brought here as an orphan by Ochberg. So he was saved, and then one other brother was saved, who eventually uh, was able to go to Israel. And uh, and but for the the all the other families, we think they were all murdered in Sobibor, or it was the last letter he got was from Sobibor. So that was First World War again. Yes, and then going into Second World War. Um. Just to answer one question, I'll talk about it in my next presentation. A number of Jews took their last names from the places where they had left. So, and I'm giving a little preview of the next presentation. My common name with all my cousins who are joining us today is Antelept. And in Lithuania, there is a town called Antelepti. And we're like 99% sure that our name was probably taken from that town. From that. So that, that was yes. very common. Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Anybody? All right, thank Hi, you. Shirley, can you hear me? Yes, Annette, I can hear you and see you. All right. Thank you so much, Shirley. I'm so touched by the amount of energy and effort and research <laughs> you put into this. It's just Wonderful. really gripping, a lot of work. Thank you. It, it's a question, a question I have often had, and I've never had an answer to, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on it, but as you pointed out, there was no CNN news, there was no internet. How did people make the decision? Did they make it individually to leave? Did they talk to rabbis? Were there groups? It could not have been easy to get out. Do you have any feelings for how they finally said, today is the day everybody lets go and how they did it? No, I have no idea. Um, things were pretty bad. And America was the, the golden Medina, Medina, is that the phrase? It was the wonderful land. Um, I'll see what I can find out for the next presentation. Um, I don't, maybe my cousin, first cousin Roberta knows why our grandparents left. I don't know if she's still on, but I don't know. But uh, she's I, furiously trying to unmute right now. Okay. Okay, this is my Roberta, my first cousin's son. So he's my first cousin once removed, Adam. And um, and she's <laughs> unmuted. Okay, Roberta, can so, you solve the mystery? Yeah, well, 
Grandpa Philip came because he was supposed to go into the Russian army. And at that time, I think you had to have travel permits in the Russian empire to go any place. So he had a travel permit to go east to Russia and he was 15 years old. He was a kind of tall, six foot tall, strong boy. And he went west to Germany and north to Hamburg and got on a boat. Now he left for that reason, but life there, you didn't put about anything about uh, individual humiliations. So no Jews could would go into the town square, he told me, because there was some kind of religious statue there. And you were supposed to tip your hat to the religious statue. And if you didn't, the boys standing around would beat you up. So, I mean, I think there were a lot of things like that that made people leave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have to talk offline about the time frame because he did. Oh, uh, Dan just told me two people that want to speak. That's why I went. Oh, um, okay. he did not come to this country until he was like 19 or 20. And he was probably mm -hmm. recruited at 14. I have his immigration. Pay. We'll talk offline. OK. Uh, and one quick thing, my grandfather, who I was very, very close with, uh, to, to get out of the Russian army, cut off his uh, big toe. That and is that one was of the, how he got out. That is one of the stories that people cut off fingers or digits. Yeah, you're right. Um, Rana, are you there? Talking to me? Uh, no, R-O-N-A, Cousin Rana. Uh, my husband said you wanted to speak. If not, yes, um, David, oh, Rana. Um, from what I understand, my grandma came here in 1909, but she came through Canada. Is that Was that common from a... Yes, from a, yes. This, and Very, she, uh, where in Canada they entered? I, I would have to double check. Uh, Winnipeg. Uh, Winnipeg somebody said but people came my my uh, roberta's grandmother and my grandmother came through baltimore and our grandfather mm -hmm. came through galveston which became galveston became a big port for jews as an wow. alternative yeah. to ellis island winnipeg yeah. is landlocked winnipeg is landlocked so they probably came through halifax okay. and some of the canadians ended up settling in um they were uh, almost like communes uh, in, in Saskatchewan, which is where my grandmother Greestorf ended up. This is my cousin from Canada. So Love. she would know. Um, David wants to speak. David Goldberg. Hello, David. Yes, I'm here. You've raised so many issues and so many questions. Um, there's a whole new literature, which you, I think you might not have read and perhaps you should. Um, which details that these were not accidental um, immigrations. They were deliberate and they were planned and they were well thought out. The people knew where they were going. They knew who they were going to. They knew where they were going to end up and why they were going to go there. There was a thing, what is <coughs> called chain migration, which is uh, simply that when one person went out, and settled somewhere, they sent word back to the shtetl and they were said, it's not so bad, come on over. And uh, it's the law of one. So when one went out, then others followed and others followed and followed and followed. And the people from America were earning, the people who went and arrived in America, were, I don't live in America, but when they were uh, living in America, they were earning money and they were sending money back home for the fares for the ships. To go out, to go out. So it is a huge new literature that we all really need to become acquainted with, because an awful lot of what we call the foundation myths, they are simply not true. Um, the, there are stories about people mutilating themselves. It didn't help them, from from what I can gather, it did not help them at all. Um, and some people mutilated others in order to avoid um, being being, being um, conscripted. But the majority of our families, my family left and began leaving in 1880, in the very early, early 1880s. My father said, you know, that he, my grandfather was avoiding conscription and so forth. 
The truth is that when my father said that, he was wrong. My grandfather was not avoiding conscription because conscription had actually ended um, in 1855 when Nicholas the second first Nicholas the first died. Um, there was conscription during Alexander II's time, but it was of a different kind of conscription. It was universal and it applied to everyone. So, you, you know, we've got to be very careful that there are huge numbers of myths. I mean, it's fascinating to hear them and to hear them today. And people are still saying them. You know, I was talking to people in Johannesburg about it a week or two ago, and they all told that we all tell the same story. It's amazing. We're still telling the same story. But I have to tell you, it is not true. OK, I, I am really, really glad you brought that up. And I have two comments. I mentioned that there was a very credible historian who said that um, all the myths of Jews leaving because of conscription were not true. And um, he makes an excellent, excellent case. I agree with you. But then other historians say there is so much anecdotal um, material that they think that it did happen. So honestly, I don't know, which is why I wanted to tell you that there was definitely a very credible dissenter. And I am glad you brought up chain migration. Um, my grandfather was the oldest of eight siblings. He went over first and he, um, he, he earned money and he brought over his siblings one by one. So I'm, I'm very glad you did bring that up. It couldn't yeah. have been too spur of the moment because you needed somebody that you were going to, who could vouch for you in America. And if you look at, at all the, um, the manifests, you will see where is this person going to? And they would have brother, uncle, father, mm -hmm. husband. And sure. um, um, David, I'm so glad you, you brought that up. That's my geneal genealogy presentation. So thank you, thank you. Um, You're welcome. There's an awful lot. I'm researching and I'm writing about my my uh, father and my mother, and it, it means I have to write a, about my grandfather to right. understand my father, and it had a huge effect upon him. I mean, he believed all of this. He believed all the foundation myths. I can understand why. But, uh, you know, it, it's a fascinating story and it really, um, a lot of the South African people, they came from, they came, I live in Ireland, by the way, and um, my father was Lord Mayor of Cork in 1977. Oh, wow. My mother was Lady Mayoress, so the only Jewish Lord Mayor and Lady Mayoress in Cork in recent history. And um, I'm researching them now to do, to do something for them um, very late in the day. But a lot of the South Africans, they started in Limerick. And there was a there was a Jewish community in Limerick of thirty five families. They all came from Lithuania um, at various times, but mostly in the eighteen eighties. And um, there were terrible, terrible problems in Limerick. That's a whole other story. The story of Limerick is another story. It's a bad story, a very bad story. Were you originally <laughs> from South Africa? They went to South Africa. My cousins are in South Africa. I don't know if there's anybody from South. You say. Lots of South Africans. Oh my gosh, yes. Lots and yeah, lots. Well, my family were the, the wine runks. And um, anybody who is a wine runk is a cousin of mine. Oh. They settled in Port Elizabeth. Oh. Oh, yeah. I heard that. I heard that. Sandy, Sandy Wine Runk married uh, Lenny Hotz, and they lived in Cape Town. Oh. You know what we may want to do? We may just oh. want to have a a session where people just want to talk and share. So um, if, if people are interested um, and the temple has a slot open, I could see just anybody that would like to do a Zoom session, seeing if you're connected and, and sharing these wonderful stories. Uh, possibly we could set that up, okay? Um, yeah, and that's really that's, good. yeah. yeah. This is Len Treibstein. I just sent you an email saying yes to, um, we would be quite interested in the session in, uh, or sessions in genealogy. And also you and I can talk about the idea that you just uh, suggested. So we'll, we'll see what we can work out. Okay, because there seems to be an interest. Yes, yes. Exactly. Great. That, that gentleman from Cook, can I just 
have a word with him for one moment. You know, do you know how to chat? You can chat with him privately. Yeah. Um, do oh, you I see it, of course. And yeah. um, sir, what his name is David Goldberg. So oh, if you go you. into chat, look for his thank name, you so much. and you can chat with him privately. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, good luck. Got a match.com going on, Shirley. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I think maybe we should wrap it up. Um, if you have a wonderful story to share, we'll set up a Zoom session to share stories. Um, and uh, I hope to see you next Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific time.